Invasive species can have a massive negative impact on an ecosystem, harming both the animals and the plant life. As I've covered many times on the channel before, invasive species can cause extinctions. But it's not only the wildlife that's affected. Because invasive species can be so damaging to an ecosystem, most governments will try and control them or eradicate them. And in most cases, this isn't cheap. It's thought that invasive species cost the UK economy at least £2.2 billion each year. And over in the US it's even worse, as invasive species cost the US economy around $21 billion per year. Of course these invasive species shouldn't be villainized, but in some cases there is a real reason to remove them. Luckily for us humans, we're not alone in the battle against invasive and introduced species, as there are many animals that will help us remove them. In this video I will be focusing on some of these animals, as I will be going through three native species that target invasive species. And for our first example we will be heading over to the Great Lakes, as our first invader is the zebra mussel. Now these small freshwater mussels are native to southern Russia and Ukraine, but they've been in the Great Lakes since the 1980s. Of course they didn't get here by swimming across the ocean, but instead they were transported via the ballast water on some ships. Although zebra mussels may seem quite unspectacular, they have caused major problems to the native wildlife, and also to vehicles and infrastructure. These mussels are filter feeders and will feed on plankton in the water column. There are also many other creatures in the Great Lakes that will feed on this plankton, and in most cases the zebra mussels are able to outcompete them. They have multiplied at an astonishing rate, and most of the other creatures are not able to keep up. They form massive populations covering the lake bed, and also covering pipes and boats. They render beaches completely unusable, and clog filter pipes and destroy boat engines. If you swim in waters with an abundance of zebra mussels, it's quite easy for you to cut yourself. And if your pets enter the water, it can also affect them too. The government have poured millions into trying to stop the spread of these mussels, but the native species have also done a very good job. There are plenty of fish and birds that will target these mussels, such as the freshwater drum, the lake sturgeon, the channel catfish, and of course a few species of diving ducks. I have chosen one of these ducks to focus on, simply because it seems to be the best at its job. As well as this, it is a very pretty species, and it is the long-tailed duck. Now this bird is normally found along the northern coastlines of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and even though it is the only member of its genus, it is similar in looks and behaviour to some other diving ducks that can be found in the Great Lakes. This duck does exhibit some sexual dimorphism, with the males having their famous long tails, and also a more striking coloration. The long-tailed duck is an impressive diver, and in most cases when it does dive it will feed on small fish, crustaceans, and most importantly mollusks. Although they usually feed close to the surface, they are capable of diving at depths of around 60 meters. One of the reasons they are able to do this is because they use their wings to dive, and most other diving ducks are not known to do this. These ducks are not found in the Great Lakes year round, but when they do visit the Great Lakes they make the most of it. They are known to gorge themselves on zebra mussels, and in some cases will swallow them completely whole. This is definitely a win-win situation as the ducks get a good meal, and the zebra mussel population is brought down slightly. Of course these ducks don't have a massive effect on the zebra mussel numbers, but along with other animals they are making a dent, and they really are benefiting the health of the Great Lakes. But for our next invasive species problem we will be heading over to Australia, as our next invasive species is the cane toad. Now as I've been over countless times on the channel before, the cane toad is one of the most famous examples of an invasive species, simply because it's caused so many problems, and has also proven to be very hard to get rid of. The cane toad is obviously not native to Australia, but was instead introduced in 1935. Around 2,400 toads were brought over from Hawaii, and this was to control cane beetle numbers. The cane beetles would feed on sugarcane, and at the time sugarcane was a very important crop to the Australian economy. Strangely this toad isn't even native to Hawaii, and it was actually introduced into Hawaii three years before the Australian introduction. This was once again for the same reason, and originally only 150 cane toads were introduced. After only 17 months their populations had exploded, and there were thought to be over 100,000 of these toads on the Hawaiian Islands. This should have acted as a warning sign, yet they were still introduced into Australia. Not only were the cane toads not very good at controlling cane beetle numbers, but they also led to the decline and extinction of several native predator species in the Northern Territory. For those of you who don't already know, cane toads are poisonous. They have toxic glands on their shoulders, and when bitten or attacked, these will excrete a poison. When many of the native predators would try and eat these toads, they would fall ill, and many would eventually succumb to the poison. Back in their native range of Central and South America, Many of the native predators have grown immune to the cane toad's poison, or have learnt how to hunt them without getting poisoned. In a completely new ecosystem, the predators were not able to adapt quick enough, and this was why there was such a decline in predator numbers. 
After a little while, the government realized their mistake and started implementing ways of controlling these cane toads. For the most part, people were asked to collect their eggs from water sources and also to humanely dispose of the adult cane toads. Surprisingly, this also comes with its own dangers because if the poison gets in your bloodstream, you can be affected. And one Australian woman was even blinded while hitting a cane toad with a hammer. Although the native predators were unequipped to deal with the cane toads at first, luckily today they have adapted and many birds are able to safely target these toads, and so can a wily native rodent. The Rakali or Australian water rat is a relatively large rodent, and is most at home in Australia's fresh waters. They have a taste for mussels, frogs and fish, but the native yabbies make up the majority of their diet. To help them swim through the water, these rodents have webbed feet, and they prefer areas with lots of vegetation, and areas where they can easily get in and out of the water. The Rakali has a complex relationship with invasive species, because they are targeted by some invaders such as foxes and cats. Despite this, in recent years they have been able to get their own back, because they've learned how to tackle the famous cane toads. At first, many of these rodents may have fallen victim to the cane toads' poison, but eventually they learn how to eat them. When they hunt cane toads, they often turn them on their back, and eat parts of them that aren't toxic. Because their toxic glands are on their shoulders, it's a good idea to avoid eating the top half of these toads, as there's no chance of getting poisoned. This means that finally the Australian native creatures are able to fight back, and hopefully because of the other native species and the Rakali, the cane toad numbers will continue to decrease in Australia. It should come as no surprise at all that for a final invader we will be heading to Florida, and strangely I won't be focusing on any particular invader. As I've covered countless times on the channel before, Florida is a hot spot for invasive species, and wherever you look it won't take long to find one. Whether it's in the water, the land or the sky, you will be able to find invasive species, and in some places they really have taken over. Some invaders are more famous than others, but they can all damage Florida's ecosystem. Because Florida has quite a unique subtropical climate, it means that quite a few exotic species can thrive here. Most of Florida's invaders are released pets, and if these were released in other states they would not survive, but in Florida they thrive. Some of the most famous examples are the large reptiles, such as iguanas, tegus, and of course large predatory snakes. These snakes are some of the most dangerous invaders, and have led to a huge decrease in mammal populations across the Everglades. Even though this is very saddening information, it's far from over for the Floridian ecosystem. Florida has a very competitive ecosystem, and this ecosystem is full of predators. Many of these native predators will target the invasive species, none more so than the American alligator. The American alligator really is one of the top dogs in Florida, and very few creatures will mess with an adult. Alligators are more than happy to target invaders, whether they be armored catfish or large reptile invaders. Famously, the large snakes have proven to be quite difficult targets, as in some cases the snakes will even eat the alligators. This really is quite an impressive battle between two large reptiles, and if you were to witness it, I doubt you'd forget it. Even though the Floridian ecosystem is far from healthy, you'd have to imagine it would be a lot worse without the American alligator. Of course there are many other examples that could have made it on this list, and I'm more than happy to make this a series. So if you know of any more examples then let me know down in the comments below. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.